Um, in the last lecture, we looked at the importance of precursor method. Um, as I emphasized in the last uh, lecture, um, precursors are a very convenient uh, route and wet chemical route to prepare complex metal oxides. Um, so, you start in solution, but you end up with a crystalline solid where uh, the atoms and the anions take their position in the right symmetry. So, this involves both kinematic approach as well as thermodynamic approach. In precursor method, I distinguish between solid solution precursors and simple precursors. Uh, today, before I discuss more with uh, the simple precursors, I just want to touch one more example to refresh our idea about uh, solid solution precursor. Um, just to recap, what is the importance of it? And then we will look more into uh, the simple uh, <coughs> precursor uh, routes. And this is the precursor wheel as I uh, put it in simple form. Um, a lot of precursors can be used to bring about uh, the metal oxide formation. But one route is a solid solution precursor route, another route is simple precursor route. So, uh, just one more example on solid solution precursors, we can think about uh, uh, zinc magnesium oxygen uh, system uh, using the same concept of isostructural quinoline complexes. Uh, in the last uh, lecture, I emphasized about uh, the importance of structural similarity and once you pack all the corresponding atoms into that crystal then when you decompose it, the corresponding metal oxide that you get will also have the finer and uh, uh, atomic level doping uh, can be achieved uh, using such a uh, principle. Now, this cartoon shows uh, how the X-ray similar patterns can be exploited for making uh, solid solutions. As you see here, this is zinc Q2 and zinc Q2 is nearly cubic um, in its uh, X-ray pattern because you have only three obvious or major peaks and they are nearly equidistant. So, uh, just by looking at the precursor X-ray, one can uh, guess what sort of crystal symmetry it can have. And uh, in this case, uh, because of uh, equidistant peaks, you can easily map it to be a cubic uh, because of higher symmetry, you get very less peaks. Whereas, when it is more complex, you get more peaks. Now, uh, look at uh, magnesium Q2. If you take magnesium Q2, again, there is a similarity between Zn Q2 and magnesium Q2. And therefore, this gives us a privilege to dope magnesium and zinc together. So, the next solid, uh, three solid solutions are uh, with varying percentage of magnesium from 5 to 15 percent. So, you can keep varying it and as you see here, all these uh, precursors are having this low degree reflections or low angle reflections at around 7 degrees. So, uh, once you ensure that such a solid solution precursor is made, then you can try to look at the possibility of converting this into the corresponding oxide. The values, the major peaks are all listed here as you can see they are all closely matching. Therefore, we can say that they resemble the same crystal symmetry. And uh, if you take the precursor itself, uh, they are highly photoluminescent, especially zinc Q2. Therefore, when you put magnesium Q2, you can try to see whether there is any systematicity with the doping concentration of magnesium. And as you would see here very clearly, this is the expanded version of uh, this region just to highlight that as you dope magnesium in zinc U2, you can see the peak maxima is shifting towards the blue region, which you would expect because magnesium uh, magnesium has a different size and it is also showing emission uh, near to uh, bluish green. So, you can, uh, you can take clue from PL that magnesium is indeed getting doped, that is why you see the peak shift. And uh, if you look at the thermogravimetry, it gives you idea about how you can uh, translate this 
quinolin 2 oxide by taking magnesium Q2 and zinc Q2. If you look at the thermogravimetry, zinc Q2 is decomposing somewhere around 450 uh, degree C, whereas magnesium Q2 is decomposing around 550 degree C. So, you need to have some idea about how the precursors decompose on their own. Uh, by just having an idea of zinc Q2, suppose you are decomposing the precursors at 500, what it means is you are in, uh, you are going to have an incomplete decomposition. Therefore, analysis of uh, thermogravimetric uh, traces is very important. And as you would see here, the DSE plot is clearly showing the dehydration step and the decomposition step and uh, melting before decomposition all are prominent and uh, this gives an idea how we can translate it into the oxide and this particular uh, x-ray diffractogram shows uh, how zinc oxide with magnesium oxide can be ably substituted and as you would see here up to 15 percent there are no traces of any uh, peak of magnesium that is coming here which means uh, absolutely magnesium is going into the zinc lattice, zinc oxide lattice. Therefore, you can say that magnesium is getting substituted and it is not a phase separation. So, uh, this is a very useful way that you can try to dope magnesium into zinc oxide uh, and uh, the uh, absorbance spectra also clearly shows that uh, there is a blue shifted absorbance. And uh, as you would see, zinc oxide is uh, absorbing, which is denoted by this curve. And uh, there is a shift uh, towards the blue with the periodic doping of magnesium. And since magnesium oxide is a high band gap material, magnesium oxide itself would come somewhere around here. And therefore, progressively, you can see um, the bandage is shifting towards the blue region. But what we have to understand. Um, the PL emission does not seem to really give the uh, necessary feature that we look for. For example, zinc oxide is showing this band to band emission which, which is very uh, useful and which is very conclusive of zinc oxide particles. They show a very small gap, a, a, a small peak and then a very broad peak around 500. This is due to defect chemistry. Uh, and as a result, we can see irrespective of magnesium oxide doping, the defect induced emission is much more compared to band to band emission. So, we may be able to prepare at low temperature, we may be able to prepare the same thing um, using a novel method, but what is important to understand is how we can get this uh, surface free defects and that is very critical. So, uh, just a mere uh, consolation of a low temperature synthesis or uh, a solid solution approach does not guarantee the end product what you uh, desire. It may be compositionally good, but then there are defects which are intricate with the precursor model. So, this we need to bear in mind and when we come to simple precursors, we are now going to talk about several uh, combinations. Uh, we can talk about uh, nitrates, hydroxides, acetates or even chlorides, all substituent uh, metals. For example, if I take metal 1 and metal 2 corresponding nitrates, I expect those to blend together so that I can get the resulting oxide by decomposing it. But there are some nitrates which have a very clear crystal symmetry. Therefore one can go for such match also. And these are more or less hygroscopic, that is why I grouped uh, these together, uh, hygroscopic. And um, because nitrates, hydroxides and acetates sometimes are hygroscopic, even chlorides we can add here. And because of that, the use of a uh, nitrate precursor or chloride precursors are very much restricted because if you are going to bring two metal salts, then hygroscopic ones will react as a result, you would not get a uh, perfect control over the stoichiometry. Whereas, carbonates and oxalates 
or mostly they are air stable and as a result it is better for us to use oxalates or carbonates as um, precursors because even when you try to weigh those starting materials you can precisely weigh that therefore the error involved in your stoichiometry will be very less. Uh, and thirdly the most uh, used among uh, precursors is sol gel precursors. I will come to this uh, shortly from now. Sol gel precursors are mostly uh, alkoxides um, when you treat any metal with, uh, with the alcohol then you can get a metal alkoxide and therefore that is largely used but as the name itself suggests there is a, a phase which where uh, you get a sol phase and then you progressively take it to a gel phase and then it brings about a metal oxygen framework which will serve as a good precursor for getting metal oxide. So, I am going to uh, take you through the all these three um, examples with the several approaches. So, um, in the next few slides I will give a representative uh, idea of how this simple precursors can be used. Uh, first one as an example I want to quote how zinc oxide can be made. Zinc oxide is not only used in uh, classical uh, electrical conductivity or uh, sensor applications of UV radiation. It is also used in variety of other application therefore, um, there are for some applications you need a very stringent control on the stoichiometry or purity. There are certain uh, applications where you really do not need such uh, phase purity. For example, if you are looking at uh, fastening the color um, for any uh, equipments sports application, uh, zinc oxide is used because in all these polymers um, you need to put the zinc oxide to filter or to absorb the UV radiation so that the coatings or the coloring agents that are added are not degraded. So, to fasten the color zinc oxide is used as a pigment in cosmetics it is used as a base because you can make a very fine zinc oxide and it is non toxic and in uh, ceramics you can use it. It is also used to bring a good blend between uh, brass and uh, uh, rubber therefore, zinc oxide comes as a very good one, but zinc oxide is not just used as additive, but zinc oxide also has a very peculiar application as a surge arrester for high voltage applications zinc oxide is a very potential one. Now, um, zinc oxide is a white powder and you know there are many ways we can prepare that. I will just show you uh, how simple uh, precursors can be used and how it can transform distinctly. This particular cartoon tells us that zinc oxide thin films can be made by merely spin coating or spray coating zinc nitrate solution, zinc acetate and zinc chloride uh, solutions. So, you can just spray it and then decompose that into a film and as you would see here in this left cartoon, this is the region where you need to get all the reflections in the right um, intensity and as you would see here um, the chloride precursors are very poorly represented and uh, then the acetate precursors, but what you see here as a good crystalline phase is coming from nitrate. So, among nitrate, chloride and acetate it gives us a very clear clue that nitrates can be uh, considered as a very useful one because it gives a uh, crystalline phase and the corresponding uh, thin film also you can see the morphology completely changes. In case of chloride because the chlorates do es escape during the heating process they give discontinuous grain growth therefore, you do not see any grain growth um, which is continuous and although the morphology looks attractive, but electrical continuity is missing between, between the grains and therefore, this particular film might lack uh, percolation. And in the in the case of uh, chloride based ones, you see lot of uh, uh, segregations or uh, larger particles which are crystallizing. So, uh, this is not a smooth growth. Uh, comparatively, nitrate appears to be much better, but then there are also a lot of voids and uh, um, the 
the films are not very smooth. So, precursors can be used, but then we should have in mind the limitation that comes along with every precursor, but the, all these precursors can be decomposed uh, in less than 300 degrees centigrade. And uh, if you look at these films, their uh, transmittance, uh, technically the transmittance has to be somewhere around 90 percent. So, you would expect a fall like this for your uh, absorbance spectra or uh, in most cases using uh, PLD or the MBE method, you can act, get a transmit, transmittance up to 80 percent. But uh, using this precursors, you can see that the transmittance is going down very abruptly and therefore, the quality of this films are not um, very resolved as in the case of PLD. However, when you look at the band gap, band gap clearly shows that uh, it corresponds to 3.3. So, for electrical resistivity purpose, all the um, films seem to uh, match with the desired uh, values, whereas the for photonic application or for <coughs> other applications which are critical with the microstructure, we seem to see a very inferior uh, film. Let us take another uh, example of garnets. Garnets are those which have A3, B5, O12 uh, sort of stoichiometry and these are all garden crystals uh, naturally occurring. For example, this is nothing but YIG uh, crystals which occur in nature and uh, to make such uh, crystals or powders, it is very, very difficult because it involves uh, uh, very stringent thermodynamic requirements. So, how do we achieve that? Uh, for example, ca case of YIG which is iron garnet, this has very wide range of applications including microwave, optical, magnet optical applications and also in non-linear optic applications it has been used. Now, how do we do that? One example is using a citrate nitrate gel because when you try to uh, deposit such layered structure with complex stoichiometry, it is always important to go for a slower method rather than a rapid method because you can get uh, a much more um, stoichiometrically stringent uh, or controlled stoichiometry in the final oxide. So, uh, citrate ni nitrate gel is one of the best methods. Why we can use citrate nitrate gel is uh, they almost behave like a combustion um, mixture because citrate forms the fuel part, nitrate forms the oxidizer part, but the best part here is instead of keeping it in solution, you can isolate that as a solid. As a result, it is possible to um, to isolate a solid which can act as a precursor to give the corresponding um, oxide. And uh, this is the difference between the regular combustion process which I discussed in one of the earlier lectures and the uh, combustion that comes out of a citrate uh, nitrate gel. So, if we do a thermal decomposition, you would see uh, exothermic peak coming and after uh, and that is mainly because of the reaction between the fuel and the oxidizer in the gel. Now, uh, as an example quoted by by th this person, um, we can actually use uh, yttrium aluminum garnet or we can also make uh, yttrium uh, iron uh, garnet. Uh, so, we can make this precursors using citrate uh, nitrate gel and then uh, as you would see in the room temperature, mostly they will remain amorphous because they actually undergo a sol gel reaction where a disordered metal oxygen bonds are made. So, in your order to crystallize this, you have to heat and uh, this is a usual protocol in the sol gel chemistry. Therefore, if you keep heating it, you can get very good phase or a single phase uh, compound, but sufficiently at lower temperatures. So, this is one approach by which one can make uh, complex oxides. Um, I will come to the chemistry of this uh, sol gel uh, in the later slides in this lecture. Citrate is uh, very useful mainly because if you look at the structure of uh, citric acid, um, 
you have a carboxylic group here, you have a carboxylic group here and then uh, there is another carboxylic group also here. Um, when metals are brought in closer proximity, these two carboxylate groups can actually bind uh, like a dentate. So, it is a mostly a bidentate therefore, it can easily cleave to, um, uh, to the metal ion and as you would see here uh, for iron tridentate, um, iron 2 citrate um, you can see a complexation of this form and on oxidation it transforms to iron 3 center and uh, this set of citrate complexes uh, usually brings about a three dimensional network. So, when you have the this set of complexation in three dimensional picture, once you start heating it all these organics will start leaving away and therefore, you are essentially leaving a metal oxygen network which is more reactive to form the corresponding oxide. So, that is the philosophy of using citrate ligand because the binding capacity is very high and therefore, you can um, build a three dimensional network of these complexes. Another example is uh, spinal oxides uh, that is gamma Fe 2 O 3 which is a very popular oxide and usually it is reddish brown in color and uh, gamma Fe 2 O 3 is uh, magnetic uh, although another phase is also magnetic that is magnetite phase that is Fe 3 O 4. Um, gamma ion oxide is particularly important for recording purposes as you would see here making this sort of needle shape or acicular shaped iron oxide is very very difficult. Therefore, if we are successful then this can find applications in uh, magnetic recording industry. There are other applications of iron oxide uh, apart from the magnetism that it holds. It is used in uh, uh, several industries mostly as pigment also. Uh, but I will just highlight how simple precursor route can be used for making this compounds. For example, um, a series of compounds have been reported by Wernicke's group and uh, this one is ferrous fumarato um, hydrazinate. In other words, use fumaric acid and make complex which will readily form and uh, you can remove the water of crystallization with the hydrazine of crystallization and that is what you call it as ferrous fumarato hydrazinate and simil similarly you can use succinic acid or malleic acid and you can form a series of hydrazine precursors. What is the use? These precursors as you would see here the final decomposition temperature is somewhere around 300 that means you can make all this iron oxide precursor below 300 and when you do that the best part is you you can stabilize uh, gamma ion oxide and gamma ion oxide incidentally is a low temperature phase and it is a ferromagnetic phase. When you try to heat this ion oxide to very high temperature you lose the magnetism therefore, gamma ion oxide transforms into a um, alpha phase and as a result you lose the magnetic property. So, to stabilize this gamma ion oxide you need a chemical route which will stabilize only the low temperature phase. As you see here gamma ion oxide uh, the reported value uh, is very peculiar uh, where you get two um, x-ray uh, diffraction peaks at 2.95 and 2.78. Uh, it can also be in cubic phase where it is again 2.95 and 2.78, but a closely re related ion oxide peak is nothing but Fe 3 O 4 but Fe 3 O 4 almost has the same reflection as that of gamma Fe 2 O 3 only thing one peak would miss here and this is the only peak that distinguishes between Fe 3 O 4 and uh, gamma Fe 2 O 3. Why it is important because both are magnetic however Fe 3 O 4 is actually a black compound so it is easy for us to guess whether it is a um, Fe 3 O 4 or Fe 2 O 3, but X-ray can be very deceptive. Therefore, the only clue that you get here is this one. So, knowing this uh, particular uh, phase, uh, if you follow all the uh, precursors, 
perfumeric succinic or malic uh, based precursors you would see here almost all the precursors are showing only selectively gamma fe 23 phase so uh, this is a very highly selective precursor that can be used for stabilizing only the low temperature phase if you need high temperature phase then you need to use a different precursor altogether one more thing we need to understand if you are transforming this to a very high temperature then you are actually going to lose the property and uh, alpha fe203 will come and the best way to distinguish alpha fe203 is you will get a peak at 3.66 so once you know that then you can understand that part of your gamma fe203 has transformed into uh, alpha so here is an example where we where we see a phase can be stabilized only at low temperature and for which you need to take a corresponding precursor all precursors does not necessarily give the high temperature phase so you need to have a uh, mechanism by which you can control the exothermicity another example of a perovskite compound as you see here uh, here is a metal ion which is actually in the a site and uh, another metal ion is there b these are the dark blue ones which are nothing but your b cation and uh, these are your uh, <coughs> oxygens in the corners of the octahedra so making this compound again is a big challenge i'll just leave one example to show how simple precursor can be used for a, this is a very old paper published in 70s uh, by bell labs by gallagher uh, i presume that uh, he passed away uh, in the last decade but one of the finest uh, um, metal scientists who really worked on a variety of metal oxide systems uh, one of his paper shows how we can make uh, rare earth ferrites and rare earth cobaltites uh, this is rare earth ferrite and rare earth cobaltite both have abo3 sort of structure and as you would see here they have used cyanide precursors uh, take for example case a is uh, here and uh, this is lanthanum iron uh, hexacyano precursors and uh, this precursor seemingly has a um, correlation to lanthanum uh, cobaltite because they almost are uh, x-ray um, similar only thing the major peaks in this case in the case of cobalt is split almost all the peaks that you see is split therefore what you assume there is from orthorhombic it is getting transformed to rhombohedral if you have 200 percent peak which is your largest peak that is usually resembling uh, rhombohedral whereas this is your orthorhombic or uh, tetragonal symmetry so you can index this but what you see here in all these cases you can get a x-ray isomorphous pattern therefore you can even make changes between la fe 1 minus x um, cobalt x c and 6 this set of mixtures can also be made because you have x-ray similarity nevertheless uh, the point i want to make here is even cyanide based precursors can become useful as you would see here that the decomposition is almost over well below 400 degrees c and there are no reports where you can find um, making uh, abo3 structures uh, with such fa uh, fairly low temperatures so low temperature process gives you advantage to get finely reactive um, powders which can be sintered to uh, theoretical density so that's the advantage of using low temperature precursors to get this oxides and uh, some more examples on complex oxides and i will give you some uh, example of how nitrates or hydroxides can be used as a precursor for example you take the case of barium uh, P BAPBO3 this is nothing but a ABO3 type of oxide and we can actually build upon this um, using a rudelson popper uh, series rudelson popper series says that with every addition of another barium you go from BAPBO3 to BA2PBO4 okay and we can further keep going adding stackings of the a side cation based oxides as interlayers 
So, we can build on this set of uh, systems for example, strontium lead oxide then you can go for another um, homologous series that is SR2 PBO4 and so on. Now, if we know this x-ray similarity of this precursors then you can even make a mixed metal uh, precursor for example, if you look at um, BAPBO3 uh, this is your nitrate precursor which is 7.99 and the strontium is uh, 7.824. So, they are having close structural uh, <coughs> dimension uh, as a result we can use this as a precursor for making uh, the compounds. Only thing is when you use simple precursor sometimes you may not be able to bring down the uh, calcination temperature in that case you have to go for very high uh, temperatures for, for, yeah, as, as you see in this case um, you have to play around between 700 to <coughs> 900 degree C to achieve this uh, <coughs> perovskite compounds. Vidya Sagar and co-workers uh, as early as 84 they have used uh, hydroxides, cyanides and nitrates as uh, precursors to prepare complex metal oxides. I will give you some more example on that. For instance, if you look at uh, lanthanum hydroxide. Uh, lanthanum hydroxide and lanthanum aluminum hydroxide both are showing same x-ray isomorph isomorphous nature and as a result you can try to make lanthanum aluminates. Similarly, lanthanum nickel hydroxide, lanthanum <coughs> cobalt hydroxide they all seem to have the same crystal symmetry and this can be usefully transformed into the corresponding perovskites and here again as I sh sh showed to you in the uh, view graph um, of this x-ray data, you can see the nitrate precursors all having same x-ray um, mor morphology and as a result a variety of solid solutions can be made uh, mis mixed metal oxides. I will come to the last example that of uh, sol gel chemistry. Uh, of all the precursors, sol gel chemistry is still thriving mainly because um, the although the cost and the stringent requirements for sol gel processing is uh, not that simple and it often involves expensive starting materials, yet sol gel precursors give a lot of advantage. What is the advantage? Number one, it can be used for not just making metal powders, but it can be used for making metal oxide films also. So, the same precursor in solution form can be decomposed to get powders or it can be decomposed to make films. Therefore, uh, in thin film uh, approach one of the um, very well studied uh, method from chemical processing is sol gel method. Therefore, it is better to understand little bit on how the sol gel processing works. Um, let us look at the definition of what it is. An increasingly popular method for producing ceramic powders is sol gel processing. Stable dispersions or sols of small particles are formed from precursor chemicals such as metal alkoxides or other metal organics. By partial evaporation of the liquid or addition of a suitable initiator a polymer like uh, three dimensional bonding takes place within the sol to form a gelatinous network or gel and the gel can be dehydrated and calcined to get uh, a intimately mixed ceramic powder. So, this is nearly a three step process where you have sol formation then you gel it and the gel builds up a three dimensional network on decomposition gives uh, metal oxide. Sol gel uh, root usually um, can be scalable, we can go for um, bulk quantities. As a result this particular uh, cartoon shows how even in a factory or R and D center you can do the scale up and as you see here these are all the uh, setup for sol gel process and it is possible for us to get even kilogram quantities. So, lab scale process, but it can be 
translated into uh, a lot um, a <coughs> industrial scalable process. The step that is involved in soil gel processing, as I told you, it is a three step process. First is taking the corresponding metal oxide in a solvent and hydrolyzing this metal alkoxide to get metal hydroxide and this metal hydroxide actually will be a gelatinous precipitate which has to be gelated which means by careful removing of this water molecules it is possible for us to gel it and uh, this gelation sometimes can take even days and therefore you got to be very patient with this gelation process and when the gelation occurs there is a network that is getting formed which is usually a three dimensional network and on carefully removing the solvent then you can actually get the hydroxide uh, particles and heating that further you will get nanocrystalline oxides. So, if you are looking for very finely divided uh, oxides and uh, of controlled morphology then soil gel process is a very good approach. In the next few slides we will see some examples of how we can make such soil gel uh, derived powders and films. So, in the next uh, slide we see uh, several uh, products can be made uh, metal oxides like uh, zirconia, copper oxide, titania uh, and as you see here a range of compounds can be made and uh, one of the specialities of this compound is compounds are um, you can actually control the size such a way to make circular disc for other applications can also be worked out. Therefore, it is very important when we try to transcend from a powder to other forms we need to know whether we have a finer control on the uh, size dispersion. Uh, one of the chief advantage of soil gel process is you can control the size so much so that they will be nearly mono size and as a result uh, sintering of this end of compounds uh, to make as disc for other applications becomes very useful. In the other precursor cases sometimes the size distribution of the metal oxide particles are very very less and as a result it is not easy to make such compacts and therefore, sol gel is still being used in industries to make targets. These are targets could be used for sputtering or for P pulse laser deposition or for MBE sort of uh, applications and uh, sol gel is still considered to be the most popular uh, method by which mono sized oxide particles can be made. So, with this um, reference to its application, uh, let us see uh, some examples of non aqueous routes to metal oxide nanoparticles using sol gel. Why we are talking about non aqueous? Because uh, once you do it in solution route which involves uh, water, then sometimes the end product can have influence because of the water content. Therefore, if you can totally make it organic, it is much more a refined technique than uh, using aqueous route uh, to get this powders. So, aqueous sol gel chemistry um, is usually making a molecular precursor and then you try to use uh, re reagents to polymerize it and then get the metal oxide network and molecular precursors are mainly metal organic compounds or they are inorganic salts. And the polymerization as I told you in the uh, previous slide, it involves two main process, one is hydrolysis and the other one is condensation process. Examples of hydrolysis, you take alkoxide and you hydrolyze, you get metal hydroxide. Metal hydroxide and condensation actually it involves a elimination of a water molecule, therefore you will get a metal oxygen framework and that you can build it for making it into a bulk form. Uh, why non aqueous reagents are, uh, or reaction is advantageous because in the case of aqueous sol gel procedures you have problem with fast hydrolysis and sometimes they are very much dependent on pH and uh, the rate of oxidation concentration of anions all this matters in aqueous chemistry. Therefore, if you use a non aqueous method for sol gel preparation it will be much more viable and uh, last of it as I mentioned to you earlier surface adsorbed water 
has a significant role on the oxide properties therefore it is better to uh, deal with a non aqueous um, protocol non aqueous solgel procedures they can actually overcome several of these disadvantages um, for example uh, what set of um, techniques can be used or um, combinations we can use uh, we can actually use a metal alkoxide and think of a ether elimination if if we, we can do a ether elimination then we can build a metal oxygen framework or we can try to look for a ester elimination and uh, in such a case you can actually get a metal oxygen framework of this kind or we can go for metal oxide and metal halide under alkyl uh, halide elimination so we can try to uh, distinctly eliminate this again get the metal oxygen framework so uh, without water we can uh, without hydrolysis step we can go for this elimination reactions and we can still bring about the same uh, final product uh, alkyl halide was actually reported very early as early as 1951 and where they have used silicon uh, tetrachloride uh, and uh, treated with the phenyl ethanol you can get the silica framework this was one of the um, best examples of solgel process which was reported and this was picked up in late 70s and 80s solgel became a very good method for making uh, metal oxygen framework or porous metal oxides this was the first report of a silica gel formation and then uh, we can actually think of making several nanoparticles with different uh, approaches one is titanium nanoparticles as you would see here the nanoparticles are nearly mono dispersed and of very very um, fine structure and uh, you can also see the lattice fringes of each titanium particle and the broadening of this x-ray clearly shows that they are nano sized uh, in nature how do we do that take titanium chloride it is very important these are very reactive therefore it has to be done in inert atmosphere if you just expose titanium chloride in air it will immediately convert into titanium sol so titanium tetrachloride and titanium propoxide if you try to do that then you can get a alkyl halide elimination all you get straight away is titanium and those are very finely divided so this is one way that we can prepare a titanium nanoparticle using a non aqueous solgel route similarly we can actually uh, take other uh, organic uh, compounds like metal cupferon complexes of iron copper and manganese and then try to uh, <coughs> do a solgel uh, approach you can see here cuprous oxides can be made um, manganese mn3o4 gamma fe2o3 all this can be made but in this case we are not actually using ROH so solgel method does not necessarily uh, demand uh, a metal alkoxide you can also start with any other organic uh, precursor zinc oxide na nanoparticles can also be made using solgel root and in this case you can actually uh, <coughs> take diethyl zinc this is ZNET twice and uh, try to um, react it with uh, uh, topo which is a solvent and then one can get uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles with the very good crystallinity so uh, this is another approach by which um, zinc oxide can be made um, again zirconia this is a very useful uh, high temperature material how do we make zirconia take uh, uh, zirconyl uh, isopropoxide and uh, zirconyl chloride if we try to add this again um, you get the uh, alkyl halide elimination and straight away you can make zirconia as you would see here each of this is a zirconia, uh, zirconia particle and they are almost mono size so if you look at the histogram of this you would see a very narrow distribution of the particle size so in a very selective way circular um, with circular morphology you can get uh, zirconia nanoparticle and not only that you, if you look carefully at the x-ray zirconia shows a cubic phase it is very important to stabilize a cubic phase zirconia 
um, under under these conditions. Therefore, uh, this is one of a very proven method by which you can make zirconia nanoparticles. But only thing, the handling becomes a problem. As I told you, all these are very expensive precursors. But if you are looking for monocyte dispersions, then you have to use uh, costly chemicals. Okay, so that is the stringent requirement in um, solgel uh, route. Again, titania nanoparticles, the methodology is the same. Use titanium chloride and titanium isopropoxide. You can see this sort of rod shape um, uh, nanoparticles are formed, and uh, these are actually formed with the different temperature and uh, gelation. The gelling time is a kinematic growth approach, and therefore, you can actually restrict the gel formation um, over a period of time and depending on the gel formation you can actually determine the length and uh, breadth of your uh, nano rods therefore the, this aging gel aging is very important while you transform it into an oxide uh, so <coughs> synthesis of perovskites and related materials the, in general the synthesis protocol is all procedures are to be carried out in glove box so this is one stringent problem and uh, we can actually try to make other combinations um, like uh, making uh, a lithium oxide or other perovskites. We can uh, follow a general pro protocol where we can mix uh, metal with uh, benzyl alcohol and then react it with um, this sort of propoxides to get mix mixed metal oxides. And how do we do that? Uh, if you are wanting to control the size and shape of this crystals, general procedure that is suggested is to put it in an autoclave and heat it. I will show you one or two examples of how uh, such mixed metal oxides can be made, uh, especially for um, oxides like perovskites. Uh, take for example, barium. Barium is a film, uh, sorry, it is a metal and it is very, very reactive. Therefore, uh, you need to keep it in a glove box and dissolve it with the benzyl alcohol and once you do that then you can dissolve barium into benzyl alcohol as a clear solution and then you can mix it with titanium propoxide. All this has to be done inside the glove box otherwise the uh, exposure of barium uh, to, uh, to air it will catch fire and titania will go into TaO2. Uh, we missed therefore it has to be handled with care and this is how it will look like barium dissolved in uh, benzyl alcohol initially it looks like this and then it dissolves into a clear solution and this solution has to be mixed with the titanium isopropoxide and this is your autoclave and you can maintain this in a um, uh, uh, with a pretreatment at 200 degree C you will get a white powder of barium titanate and that th this is the general protocol that is followed. So, barium titanate if you want start with barium metal mix it with benzyl alcohol and uh, add it to titanium propoxide heat it in an autoclave at 200 degree C you get barium titanate. But the advantage of using this in an alcohol uh, in an autoclave is that you are not only generating a high pressure but you are also lowering the temperature. So, at high pressure you are able to stabilize all these high temperature phases. So, this is one way a modified high pressure route. Uh, I will talk to you about the hydrothermal process in the later uh, lectures. Uh, similarly, if you want strontium titanate you have to start with strontium and the barium strontium um, mixed, mixed titanates you can do that and again lithium niobate then you start with lithium and you can try to uh, take the corresponding alkoxide. So, th this is one way you can try to make this uh, compounds as you would see here lithium niobate shows a very nice crystalline one whereas in the case of titanates these are phase pure but the broadening x-ray broadening shows that they are really in a nano size. And uh, these are all some of the view graphs that I wanted to show just to say what sort of particles that we can get and uh, whether they are crystalline all this can be mapped with the TEM pictures these are the TEM morphology of the um, of the particles 
and uh, uh, in this case lithium niobate uh, gives a polycrystalline ring pattern whereas barium titanate gives a polycrystalline ring pattern but uh, not with this dots this shows that the order or the symmetry is distorted little bit whereas in this case you can see that the powders are nearly amorphous they have just started crystallizing. So, all these informations you can get from the TEM picture and uh, we can also make simple oxides take uh, benzyl alcohol and put uh, vanadyl isopropoxide uh, in an autoclave then you can get vanadium oxide, niobium oxide, tantalum oxide, indium oxide all this can be uh, done with a precise control on the geometry and shape of these particles as you would see the x-rays are very clearly showing that and uh, you, you can also find out at low temperature when you heat the samples they are, iso uh, they, they are amorphous in nature but they crystallize when you take it to high temperature. These are the TM characterization uh, results which shows that uh, salt gel process has a size and shape control therefore you can see tantalum oxides um, very nice uh, lattice fringes of this is seen and you know almost all cases you would see a polycrystalline feature and uh, here you can see square uh, or rod shape uh, particles um, the here again V2O3 uh, particles are agglomerated and uh, similarly we can uh, show tin oxide the tin indium oxide and uh, nice indium oxide particles can be formed using TM. So, uh, in brief um, solgel uh, process can be a very useful method for uh, precursors. These systems bear a very high potential uh, for making high purity metal oxides via soft chemistry route and uh, the, therefore, uh, among the precursor routes uh, solid gel precursor route is one of the very uh, coveted and uh, more used method. The reactions are simple, easy to scale up and they form highly crystalline nanopowders. Nanoparticles in form of powders are highly desired for applications as a result solid gel can be uh, used for scaling up operations. Um, to sum up on these two lectures on precursors, I just want to make two comments. One is Precursor routes therefore range from simple to complex mechanism and procedures. So, as you saw examples of simple um, uh, precursors like nitrates, hydroxides, something can some of these can have x-ray similarity, we can widen the scope of solid solutions, but usually they are cheaper and therefore you can try to make the corresponding oxides at a fairly low temperature. But when you look for high purity and mono size and lot of other stringent requirement on your final products, you need to go for sophisticated methods. But there are um, give and take in, in each approach. Um, so, there are certain things that the sol gel chemistry approach lacks which you can take it from simple precursor routes. And as I told you sol solid solution precursor route is one of the other approach which really stands off, uh, but then there again there may be compromise in the um, in the issue of uh, the final properties. So, um, precursor routes can give us uh, a lot of dimension to making new metal oxides. Uh, there may be some phases which may not be known, but precursor routes can help us understand and uh, help us synthesize such uh, new uh, stoichiometries or new phases mainly because what is achieved at high temperature can be realized at low temperature. As a result it provides a new pathway to stabilize metastable phases also. So, um, we need to take uh, all these issues into consideration when we try to look at making new stoichiometries and new metal oxide combinations.